Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very, very welcome to this second event in the 2023 Development Matters series, which uh, uh, the IIEA hosts and which is supported by Irish Aid. We're delighted to be joined today by Mr. Gilbert Ungbo, the Director General of the International Labour Organization. The Director General will speak to us on the topic of the indispensability of social protection and the costs of inaction. He'll speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will have a Q&A session. First, some housekeeping points. Um, both the Director General's presentation and the Q&A session uh, will be on the record. You're invited to submit questions, comments, observations as they occur to you during the session using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA, and the event will also be live streamed. Director General, you're very, very welcome. Uh, the Director General is a former Prime Minister of Togo, and he is the 11th person to hold the position of Director General at the ILO, and he's the first African to do so. Prior to taking up office, he was the President of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD. He also previously served as Deputy Director for Field Operations and Partnerships at the ILO, and he held several posts at the UNDP. And he was also Director of Finance at the International Bank of Mali. He, was also, he is also the Chair of UN Water and Chair of the Board of the Natural Resource Governance Institute. I would now like to invite Ambassador Noel White, uh, who, as Keenan said, is, the, uh, is Ireland's permanent representative to the UN in Geneva and to other international organisations, to say a few words on behalf of Irish Aid and the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. Noel, over to you. Thank you very much, David. And, and, and like you, I'm, I'm delighted to be here for this webinar this afternoon uh, with uh, Gilbert Ungbo the Director General of the International Labour Organization. It's a real pleasure uh, and a privilege. And, and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us uh, today, Director General, and in particular for doing so on what is effectively the eve of the International Labour Conference, which kicks off here in Geneva, down the road uh, on, on Monday morning, arguably uh, the most important date in the annual ILO calendar. Um, so thank you for that um, and for, for taking the time out. Um, thank you also to the IIA uh, for hosting this, this webinar as part of the Development Matters series, which of course is proudly supported uh, by Irish Aid. Um, our discussion today on, as David has said, the indispensability of social protection and the costs of inaction um, is both an important and a timely one. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it, it seems obvious to say it, but nonetheless, across the world, we are facing immense challenges, old and new including around food and nutrition insecurity, deeply entrenched poverty, and of course, what is the existential threat uh, of climate change. Of course, there is no one solution to all of this. These are complex issues requiring complex responses, and responses which I think we can agree need to be robust, uh, ambitious, uh, and interconnected. And clearly, social protect protection is one of the most powerful tools that we have available to us in shaping our response to these issues. Um, in Ireland, social protection, of course, is an established and an essential feature of our social contract. We are very fortunate in that respect. This is not something we should take for granted. Globally, an estimated 4 billion people remain without access to any form of social protection. Um, we have seen the transformative power that this can have and how it can be used quickly and innovatively and effectively to respond to new challenges. This was particularly the case during the pandemic with the pandemic unemployment payment, which was central to our overall response to the pandemic. Social protection, of course, is also fundamental to our international development work, including our humanitarian commitments. And the ILO is a critical partner for us in the implementation of those commitments. Happily, Ireland and the ILO have similar priorities in this area. So we focus on strengthening national protection systems, of course, but, but perhaps more importantly, we have a shared ambition to advance towards a human rights-based and a an, an universal approach to social protection. We believe together that this can deliver cost-effective, transformative, 
and indeed scalable change where it is needed most and when it is needed most. So it is a great pleasure uh, to hear today from Director General Ungbo about the important work that the ILO is doing in this area. The Director General, of course, uh, is the expert that we need to be hearing from today. In addition to his role as Director General, he has deep experience, as David has said in his introductory remarks, in development matters over many years. As a former president of IFAD, he has invaluable insight into the fundamentals of food and nutrition security and into the global structures uh, of, of development assistance. And of course, as a former Prime Minister of Togo, he has an instinctive appreciation for the politics and the wider context in which development matters play out, and not an important attribute in the times in which we live. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Director General Ungbo today to address you on the topic of the indispensability of social protection and the costs of inaction. Monsieur le Directeur Général, un grand merci. Vous avez la parole. Thank you so much uh, um, for, for having me um, um, today, um, dear colleagues, uh, and, and allow me to say a particular um, um, greeting to uh, Ambassador um, Donorio, and, and I remember um, vividly um, the essential role um, that you play when you were uh, representing Ireland in, uh, in New York and all the, the path we want us to go through to move from the MDGs to the SDGs and so many things. So I'm very uh, humbled to, uh, to have this opportunity to see um, all of you, um, all of you today. Listen, um, for, and again, I want to thank you for inviting uh, um, ILO and myself uh, as Director General to, uh, to address you, particularly um, in, uh, on, on, on the subject matter that is so key uh, um, to, um, to, to us. Because our starting point is that social protection is not charity. We want to make that clear. For us, it is a right that is dovetailed to all human being and needs. First recognized as a human right uh, in uh, Article 22 of the 1948 uh, um, Human Right uh, to Social Security um, and is anchored in so many other human rights instruments and international social security uh, standards. However, Almost half of the global population, and you, you just pointed out, four billion, um, you know, co-citizen, um, still does not. That half of the population does not have, uh, cannot enjoy the right, and is unprotected, while others are only inadequately uncovered. So this is uh, unacceptable and impedes development. And some, I'm sure you will remember during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, what social protection could do, the power of social protection in protecting people and enterprises for that matter of fact, and containing the worst parts of the crisis. Uh, without the massive expansion of social protection, uh, and we um, in ILO, we <coughs> um, counted um, up to 2,000 different type of measures that were adopted by different crisis, uh, countries um, so that um, the, the, the cracks um, um, could be contained. Otherwise, it would have been uh, much, much, much worse. However, most of these policy responses were only temporary and almost all have already ended. Even in less turbulent times, social protection is still indispensable for addressing the day-to-day -day life cycle challenges we all face. It ensures access to healthcare, income security in case of illness, unemployment, maternity, parental leave, old age, etc. Uh, in a way to preventing poverty and reducing inequality, including gender-based uh, inequalities. The redistributive effects of social protection create more equal societies, making social protection a key ingredient of um, social justice. 
So social protection is a well-established element of our social contracts. Uh, um, and Ireland is a very good uh, example in, uh, um, and quite frankly, in the whole Europe, we have to say, and increasingly uh, in the rest of the world. So many uh, countries have understood that they do not need to wait to build uh, a social protection system after they have developed. Rather, you need to build social protection system in order to develop. And that for me, I don't want to take it for, uh, for, for granted. Because despite progress in uh, expanding uh, social protection, if I were to describe the state of social protection today, I would say progress has been too little and quite frankly, too slow. You know, in addition to the, the 4 billion that we, we just uh, uh, talked about, let's say, for example, on the, uh, on the, the, the case in uh, um, Africa, where only 17.4% of people are covered to have any, some kind of coverage, not even the full, what we call in ILO, the, the floors. Um, and this undermines the economic and the social development of the continent. Worldwide, fewer than one in five unemployed workers actually receive unemployment benefits. Another data is 2.7 billion people are not protected by any kind of uh, health protection um, scheme. So I can, I can go on, um, but these protection gaps hold back our social and the economic development. The cost of inaction is and not investing in the social protection are enormous. This is why um, recently I was in a mission in Ghana. We were saying that it's not just playing with the, with the world, um, the world. We need to start looking at the social protection as a budgetary um, expense or expenditure is rather a social investment because the absence of social protection has adverse implications for human well being and for social and economic development. So, the social protection supports not only the economic dynamics by unlocking uh, latent and untapped productive potential by investing in the human capabilities but also by stimulating the entrepreneurship, contributing to the productivity of enterprises and uh, stimulating growth, particularly at the micro and uh, on small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. And it can be uh, especially critical during the economic uh, downturns. So in short, it is clearly irrational not to invest in social protection. Consequently, there is an urgent need to provide at least a basic level of social security for all. This is why we promote a social protection flow, what I was referring to earlier, to ensure that everyone has access to at least a basic level of social protection throughout their lives. And this flow, this flow provides um, income security for children, persons of working age, and older persons, and in particular for those with specific needs, such as a person with disabilities. It also ensures that everyone has effective access to at least essential healthcare. So let, let us be very clear about what the social protection flow does not mean. It does not mean that we implement some kind of party social safety nets that provide limited time-bound, um, unpredictable protection uh, that uh, people cannot count on. That will not do it, let's be honest. The, the social protection floor need to be part of a universal scheme based on promoting both horizontal and vertical um, extension strategy in line with international social security standards, especially uh, Convention 102, which defines 
what the minimum standard uh, in social um, security and the social protection floor um, recommendation, ILO recommendation 202, uh, which was uh, uh, adopted in, uh, uh, in, in 2012. When I was referring to the horizontal uh, dimension, is in a way to seek um, uh, to extend at least a basic level of core benefits as um, to as many population groups as possible and as fast as possible. And this could mean providing universal benefit for children, basic um, old age pension, or social assistance for vulnerable groups. The vertical dimension uh, referred to the uh, increase in scope of coverage, the range and level of benefits often through social insurance schemes, which can provide higher value and more comprehensive benefits. This can be financed by a mix of social insurance contribution and complemented by tax um, financing. As such universal social protection systems need to be comprehensive, um, adequate and sustainable as we affirmed uh, in, uh, two years ago in 2021 uh, by uh, uh, ILO International Labor Conference uh, um, here in Geneva. We therefore support um, countries in, uh, that in progressively building systems that uh, are universal and accessible to all, systems that are non-discriminatory uh, and responding to specific need sustainable and equitably finance covering the full range of risk uh, from uh, cradle to, um, to grave. And we need systems that provide adequate benefit to ensure decent living standards. And systems that are anchored in national legislation and providing effective uh, um, complaint and, uh, and uh, corrective uh, correction uh, mechanism. In this uh, context, um, let me, um, I would like to acknowledge the um, excellent partnership uh, with the government of uh, Ireland, uh, particularly um, um, Irish aid, uh, in supporting several countries uh, to, um, uh, and to build their social protection uh, systems. The, for countries to build the social protection systems and to close uh, the social protection gap, they need more investment, particularly, obviously, in low-income countries, and I know the focus of Irish aid in, uh, in low-income countries. So while high-income countries allocate 16.4%, um, for example, of the GDP to social protection, um, certainly um, um, outside the healthcare um, perspective, the low-income countries merely uh, assign 1.1% of their GDP. So this means there's a huge financing gap that needs to be filled. And the fiscal challenge is uh, exacerbated uh, today by the uh, pronounced income concentration uh, that we know of. You know, it's important to remind ourselves that the poorest half of the global population, half of the global population barely owns any wealth at all and possessing just 2% of the total assets. Whereas the 10% the riches of the global population own 76% of all the wealth on that. And something that is also quite very uh, concerned of, of mine is the, the, the surging uh, military expenditure, uh, which reached um, a, a new all time high, and particularly given the, uh, um, the invasion of uh, Ukraine by uh, Russia. And we have. You know, in new all-time high of uh, 2.2 trillion in, in, in 2020 and uh, 2022. And this may undermine existing commitment by diverting resources either away from ODA spending or resources that could be, um, add to, uh, could be added to the current um, level of uh, commitment, uh, ODA commitment. The other um, dimension which for us is quite important, the distribution of the labor income, which shows that uh, pay inequality uh, remain an issue. You know, the, the lower half of the workers in the income distribution globally, the lower half earn about 8% of the total labor uh, income. So that in, in, in itself um, tell, uh, tells um, a lot. 
And uh, when you add also the dimension of the uh, the, the debt uh, management, the, the the debt distress and the widespread austerity, um, all of that just exacerbated uh, um, exacerbates uh, this troubling context and and, and uh, really make it even difficult the achievement of the SDG themselves. So the the challenge of finding fiscal space to fill the financing gap we have to recognize is a difficult, a daunting one. So with this uh, state of play of power and wealth uh, distribution, can we really say that the universal social protection financing gap is uh, unsurmountable? I sincerely, I want to reject any uh, defeatist attitude. What we need? is a much more determined political will for a decisive resolve to support a total reset of our global fiscal and monetary uh, and framework. A framework that will truly and equitably bring together the three pillars of our common destiny, the necessary um, economic growth, taking into account the protection of the environment coupled with the scientific and technological progress and social justice. And this will require a concerted effort by a coalition of actors, all of us in the multilateral, private sector, um, academia, bilateral, all of us, the IFI. So this is why here in, uh, in ILO, I'm calling for a coalition for social uh, and justice. Um, for us to be able to, to, to move the needle. We really need, as I said, not to um, be a defeatist. Our global uh, ambition must be commensurate with the scale of the challenges we face, harnessing our unique tripartite convening power uh, uh, in ILO and guided by our, uh, our um, principle and values on that. So we, um, we, want to let me end uh, here by again reiterating the importance for us to really be focusing um, on uh, as part of our fight against inequality and um, focusing on the global accelerator on job and social protection that I'm sure uh, you are aware of that the Secretary General uh, Gutierrez uh, with Guy Ryder, my predecessor launched um, in, uh, in 2021 which now is taking off um, in a way for us to have a decisive contribution in helping with the countries, particularly the low income countries, um, um, to, to sustain their ability to finance uh, a, a minimum flow in terms of social justice. Let me uh, um, stop here, and I'm sorry to have been a little bit too long. Thank you so much. Over to you. Director General, thank you very, very much for a very powerful uh, presentation, uh, which is uh, thought-provoking for, for all of us. And um, we'll now open the floor to uh, Q&A. And I would like to put, first of all, to you a question which comes from a former Irish government minister who is the, the chairman of the uh, of our Parliamentary Committee on Social Protection, Mr. Dennis Nocton. And uh, his question, Director General, goes as follows. With regard to the proposed social protection floor, has any consideration been given to in indexation of such a floor? He asks this because due to rising inflation in many countries uh, with existing welfare supports, the lack of index indexation is undermining basic living standards by, by stealth, in other words, uh, sort of by the back door. He also notes that you were saying that most of the 2000 COVID supports globally have now ended. But has the ILO noted uh, the introduction of any specific supports for employees who are unable to work because of long COVID? So if I could put those questions to you first, Director General, that would be very helpful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, um, David, for those two questions. Um, the first one, in terms of the indexation of the flows, um, clearly the answer is yes. The, not only the, our recommendation push in that direction, ourselves in ILO, as part of our, our um, um, work or our tech, uh, development cooperation program with the country, this is what we are, uh, we are pushing for. 
This also one that it's a little bit linked to the uh, vertical and the uh, uh, horizontal dimension that uh, we are pushing for. Sometimes what uh, we notice on the ground, what the country uh, are faced with is the dilemma between the indexation on one hand and maybe expanding the coverage or expanding the, the outreach of the population that you want to, uh, you, you, you want to cover. Um, linked to that, even um, the more than the, uh, the social protection scheme, talking about indexation, the currently what we have, what we see in both developed and uh, um, low income countries is the fact that the the, the wages, the, the wage growth, is quite much below the inflation, and and much below the productivity growth, is in itself also causing another. Uh, a problem which is similar to the indexation. Um, the, the challenge is that sometimes you have a um, social protection scheme, but that does not necessarily contribute to reducing the, um, the, the, the equality. So is it an important uh, um, dimension that we have to look at it? And, um, you know, I see this uh, indexation challenge um, together with the, uh, um, the, the demographic challenge that the global north is uh, is facing as one of the, um, the, the the critical one if you look at a lot of the social security um, scheme um, um, in, in, even in Europe uh, you will see that there's a need for such uh, uh, indexation to be much more um, active the um, uh, the, uh, the impact in terms of the um, the the, the covid uh, uh, impact to the coverage and those coverage that has been uh, uh, um, ending. Unfortunately, we are seeing too many uh, cases where and the problem uh, remain uh, remain unsolved. On on, on that, um, we, we there's a tendency about behaving like now COVID is uh, fully behind uh, fully behind us, and the, the the scheme that you put in place to ensure that and those has uh, been uh, long uh, affected by COVID and. Uh, with or without necessary ability to uh, to return to, uh, to to the to the job market is uh, is quite a, a difficult uh, a difficult one. Um, depending on the country, we have also have noticed that that also get you know um, mixed up um, with the other dimension we are looking where uh, people tired of uh, um, job seeking just decide to withdraw. From the, um, from the uh, from, from the, the labor market in uh, in itself on on that so that is compound uh, um, impact on, on that the, the the common point about the two question um, back to our notion of the floor and to be honest when we talk about the floor for us it's kind of the bare minimum um, and sometimes that bare minimum doesn't even make it to, to be uh, to be honest on, on that over. Thank you very much, Director General. I have a question also from David Joyce of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, who is also a worker delegate to the International Labour Conference, which is about to begin. Um, he thanks you very much for your presentation, and he, he asks, what is your own uh, outlook for that conference? How do you see it unfolding? The, um, no, of, of, of course, uh, um, to be uh, transparent, you may have seen in the, in the papers a serious attack um, these uh, days about the presidency of the, uh, of, of, of the, uh, of, of the conference, uh, which um, for me is a very good question of whether you know or you don't, or how the, the, the whole international system works. It reminds me, um, I don't recall which month exactly, when there have been a lot of concern expressed in different part of the world, uh, whether or not Russia should be allowed to to chair um, the Security Council on on uh, on uh, given the invasion, etc., the breach of the international law. So for us, um, we have to manage um, this and give it to the government because this is really a uh, government uh, um, decision. And the government uh, essentially are having um, tough analysis of. Um, if you were to start um, defining what are the criteria to meet or not to meet before you allow, et cetera, maybe there are so many uh, of the 200 plus countries in the UN system that will always fall short in one dimension or another. 
and that in itself, you will be solving one problem just to create um, other problems going from a, a Coke to, uh, to Pepsi uh, on that type of uh, um, situation. So I believe uh, now we're trying to handle uh, that, uh, that dimension. But the substance of the, uh, of the conference uh, um, itself, uh, we are really looking um, forward. We have uh, four uh, uh, major uh, dimensions. First of all, there is a, um, a possible standard setting on the apprenticeship on that, which we believe is a huge um, uh, um, dimension for us, particularly when we look at that in terms of uh, youth unemployment and when we look at that in terms of just transition uh, in, uh, toward a, a, a decarbonized uh, um, uh, economy. Um, there, there's another big um, discussion will be um, the one around the protection. So we will come back to what we are uh, we talking about in terms of social protection, including also protection of the vulnerable groups and fighting against discrimination um, and, 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 uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, you will not be surprised also that uh, we expect the, uh, the 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 committee on the uh, on, on on the just transition itself to also be one that will draw a lot of attention. And for us, it's not only just transition in terms of climate change; it's also digital uh, just transition in terms of uh, uh, move toward um, uh, digital and uh, digital economy, and also the um, energy energy transition. Uh, with the risk of, uh, um, we know very clearly, and I know research confirmed that very clearly that those transitions are going to create more jobs than those that will be lost on that. So if you look at that mathematically, so it's even good news, but the, 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 the math doesn't take away the fact that those that are going to be in the category of jobs to be lost, we need to make sure that nobody is left behind. And therefore, the whole uh, re, uh, skill, uh, reskilling, uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, linked to the apprenticeship. So you have that, uh, uh, that, that nexus, uh, which is, so we are looking uh, um, forward to, uh, to, the, um, to the substantive side. It's quite, uh, at least going to be quite a uh, very important uh, two weeks for us. Mm, indeed, the best of luck with us. Um, uh, Director General, you, you talked also about the huge challenge of the, um, uh, of, of the financing gap uh, in, in relation to social protection systems. What ca can be done concretely to try to address this? I mean, I know that you have been exploring G7 and other frameworks as a way of trying to draw uh, direct international attention to this. I mean, we've all seen the huge importance of uh, basic social protection from the pandemic. So the world has seen that there is no alternative, yet it is a huge task to try to persuade the wealthier countries to uh, divert uh, resources, for example, away from military expenditure. That was a very good point you made. What can you do concretely at the ILO to try to take that debate forward? Um, this is one of the uh, uh, one of the reasons why we are launching a, a coalition for ju for social justice. What we really trying to we want to do is first of all to this debate what we have in now to have as much as that to bring the global attention to elevate the political awareness and, and and discussion and debate on that and making sure that in all those major agreements be it political economic financial or commercial agreements uh, that we embed a, a social justice dimension a, 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 in this case a protection um, um, that dimension no you will be um you know we next uh, uh, on the uh, 14th of june uh, 14, 15, we're going to have a special um, specific panel and we have four panels. And the panel on protection, you can see that this is getting so much registration. Um, on The panel on social protection on one hand, and the other hand is trade and labor rights. On, on that is also getting, so you, so on one hand, we really want to elevate that debate, which is one. Secondly, is, uh, what we believe is important is also to work with the, uh, the, the, the countries we are assisting. And, and, and that um, ILO is uh, working right now with IMF. And when we took four countries as the pilot cases, uh, Togo, Mozambique, Iraq, 
uh, and um, the, 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 for, for uh, Uzbekistan, um, where we are looking together with IMF the fiscal space and how we can maximize the social spending on, on that. So ultimately, I think if we are able to do that, so because you know, when you have a, an economic downturn, the temptation is always to cut on the public services and uh, looking at public services, and therefore you hit the social protection schemes on that. So we want to work on that as well. Obviously, we want to also continue making appeal and as much uh, and the representation for in, increase the portion of the ODA that goes to the investment and the sustainable investment uh, and to avoid the short term that like we saw during COVID and short term type of investment and looking at that in building the institution that are, um, um, themselves. So we do the, the financing is a is a major uh, a major dimension and we think that we have to have a combination of different uh, um, uh, um, scheme, but ultimately is to the country own national uh, revenue collection and um, uh, budgetary uh, management to be able to add, to finance that uh, minimum, that the flow we are referring to. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question here about um, the particular challenge in creating uh, a social protection system in countries uh, where there is turmoil, where there is conflict. Uh, one thinks of, for example, Afghanistan. What do you do in a country like that where basic infrastructure uh, ha has collapsed? How, how do we uh, either create or sustain a social protection system? Uh, unfortunately, countries like Afghanistan or countries that are coming a uh, protracted crisis or, 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 or different type of crisis, um, um, those are the countries that are much more in need. Mm. And, uh, you know, ironically, uh, um, those are the countries where the ins institutions are quite the weakest. So we, we, you know, we do believe, when you start looking at that social protection, um, I want to insist on this, going beyond social security, when you start looking at that from a protection perspective, you still need to build immediate mechanisms. Um, countries like Afghanistan, you know, social protection is also, for example, uh, access to education, uh, you know, enabling um, the, the children to be able to access to education. So in those type of things, by having um, um, school meal programs, that's where I do think um, in, in the short run, the ODA the, and the humanitarian investment, you know, what are the bridge from humanitarian to development has to invest in, in um, the, the social protection scheme that at the same time encourage medium term, um, solving medium term development issues. So, um, access to the, uh, to the minimum health care. So, you, you, you know, you cannot put a health insurance in place if there's no doctor. And if you can't even have the, the medication and the pharmacy uh, system working. So this is what we also call about those start building from scratch. So in, in country like crisis, uh, by the way, uh, um, we start doing much more in, uh, in that. It's important to mix both the shorter, um, what I call the humanitarian or the, 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 the nexus, the humanitarian development on one hand and long-term long -term building the institution at the, same, at, the, at the same time. But they are very, very much more Difficult, I have to, but they have to solve this whole, the Yemen uh, on, on, on this whole advent. Then you have, um, very quickly, then you have the, the, the other type of crisis um, um, in, in, in uh, Turkey uh, um, and, uh, and, Syria, uh, and, and Syria. Very good example. It was relatively easier for a country like Turkey that has much more functioning institution to have immediate release and protection scheme compared to Aleppo or, or, or northern part of uh, um, Syria, for, um, for example. Indeed. Um, you spoke at the beginning, Director General, about um, social protection as a human right, and, you're, and you made a very uh, a strong point there. What, what more can we do to highlight that to make sure that that is actually accepted universally, because I sometimes think that uh, uh, it's uh, people pay lip service to it. But you know, the reality is, you pointed to the fact that it is codified as a human right. But is there more that can that that we can do to 
to to win acceptance for that worldwide. The, 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 yeah, and I'm very glad you raised that, and uh, uh, we need all of you to help us uh, continue advocating. Uh, for us, um, the very first thing is to, you know, uh, um, we still have our recommendation to, to that uh, not all countries have, uh, uh, have ratified and, and uh, implemented. Uh, already by uh, implementing the existing or the convention uh, on the social security to, to first ratify that, is a, a first step. Uh, uh, secondly, obviously, I'm very um, encouraging country to do what other countries uh, have done. You know, an example comes to my mind is South Africa, where the, the right to um, to water, uh, um, water and the energy are constitutional rights uh, on on that. So, by, by the mere fact that they are uh, ingrained in the constitution although the government still may not be in a position to respond fully, it forced the government to have that high on their agenda. So I tend to encourage um, what I call uh, any attempt at the national or international level to really embed part of the minimum rights. Uh, if in all our constitution, we want to um, recognize our freedom um, um, of speech or, or freedom of expression, for me, it's also important to have some basic uh, uh, social protection uh, um, rights embedded in our fundamental laws. Um, absolutely. Um, I have a question here uh, about the, the impact of the global cost of living crisis at the moment, uh, and indeed of, of rising inflation. This means that consumer purchasing power is reduced, and in many developing countries, this has led to an increase in the number of people working in the informal sector. What can the ILO do to improve job security in developing countries to deal with the issue of more and more jobs being ending up in the informal sector? Um, particularly, first of all, I want to acknowledge that um, we noticed uh, um, that, you know, the, if you look at the 15 years, um, Pre, uh, pre COVID 19, um, the informal economy has been formalized at least slowly, but we did have, uh, we, gained, we gained five, six points um, in formalizing. Mm -hmm. And that five point that we gained were quickly, um, you know, uh, totally um, ripe off and uh, totally erased um, during COVID. And since then, it's really rather increasing than going. We are not even back to the free COVID um, level. So the, I really want to acknowledge that. What we're doing again in terms of the whole uh, informal uh, informal economy are uh, at different, uh, different uh, um, levels. One, uh, we, we do think that what we're discussing about having um, all the general group having access of minimum um, social protection floor. Is is uh, is, is uh, essential. Um, the 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 second thing is, you know, when you look at that, you need also some incentives for the the the, the micro and the uh, SMEs to formalize. You need to have some kind of in uh, program incentives, and, and that can also be um, linked to the um, the offers on the table from the protection uh, from the protection side. Uh, and thirdly, I also believe you have to continue working on using um, the, 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 the fiscal policy as a way to encourage uh, formalization. Not, the, not very often what we know um, from, from Latin America to, 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 to Africa uh, uh, and, and uh, Southeast Asia, uh, South and Southeast Asia, you, you really notice that when the, uh, the fiscal policy is really just used to quote unquote, arrests um, and people, then they will tend to go to the, um, to the, uh, to the informal um, um, on the set. So I want, so do that structural thing, uh, let alone the fact that in itself you need to encourage um, uh, business training and access to, uh, to IT and, and, and the technology um, platforms. Um, we, we have to dissociate um, the, when we talk about the informal, informal economy, there's also a new form of uh, um, informal economy, which doesn't mean necessarily that um, people are um, um, 
in the most vulnerable categories, uh, particularly when you think about the, um, the um, digital economy, the workers on the platform. Some are vulnerable, some are not. So it is also a matter um, of bringing um, the informal uh, economy to formal, so to optimize um, the tax collection system um, as well. So all of that, what I, I have to say, it may or may not be linked to the challenge we have with the, um, the loss in the purchasing power on, on that. The, the, the loss of that purchasing power just makes it worse. But even if we didn't have that, since COVID, we noticed that the problem is there and is a, um, a huge one. And back to the, 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 the purchasing power um, it, itself, you know, um, the, the, we have to recognize first in ILO, and ILO does recognize that, that the, the last, you know, a year and a half or, or, two or so, uh, what the central bankers have been doing to fight the inflation is giving um, a result to, to a certain extent. We know that at least the, the inflation, um, I believe IMF is still projecting, um, worldwide up to up to seven percent, I think, uh, for the 2023. But we know that uh, from 2024, the tendency is that hopefully things will be down under control. So I don't want to be mi uh, mistaken. It's important to fight inflation; otherwise, we are all doomed. That being said, the my concern is that most of the people at the table in making decision to how to fight uh, inflation not necessarily take into account the need to really still protect the most vulnerable group. The protection, uh, the protection system, the social protection system, while making the macro decision. Um, and, and we have seen that in, uh, in, in, in COVID. A lot of uh, international community, including what I was aware before in, in, in IFA, um, the, 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 the extra financing bring to the, uh, to the country including the distribution about the special drawing rights. But once you arrive at the country level, we don't listen, you know, making sure that the redistribution within the, how it's used to ensure that the most vulnerable group, uh, the most beneficiary, we, we were not necessarily very successful there. So, so there are so many dimensions on it. Indeed. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, I have another question which, asked what can the ILO do to create or, or to support jobs which, um, which support the green transition? In other words, what can you do to create more jobs which uh, uh, um, advance the climate goals of, of, of governments, both in developing and in developed countries? Well, for us, what, we, what we, are, we start doing, we have been doing that for a few years, but um, kind of uh, um, stepping up our effort is uh, through our research capacity and um, being able to identify sectors that will be, uh, let's say, clean energy, decarbonized economy, and that at the same time rich in terms of job creation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Secondly, is really the whole um, preparing the workers for we, what we call for tomorrow's job, almost today's job, um, in making sure that you know all of us today are you know fascinated by uh, chat GPT. Um, but the, the heart of the matter is how do we make sure that we can be tool um, ourselves, we can uh, reskill and upskilling or totally uh, shift those that are in the sector that are quite very vulnerable and providing those training, making sure the policy at the country level are adjusted to, um, and to create a conducive environment for the worker to be able to go through that um, and tra transition in terms of training and re uh, uh, scaling. And finally, creating the, the, the policy environment that encourage the youth um, to really uh, um, you know, go through uh, entrepreneurship in um, a, a clean energy or, or, or decarbonized economy and domain. And uh, our time is coming to an end now, Director General, but uh, one final question here. Um, 
What are the big challenges that you see on the global labour market at present? I mean, if you were to think, you know, five or six uh, uh, most pressing uh, issues, what are they? Wow, that's a, you know, that's a very difficult, and I hope I can limit to five. Um, <laughs> uh, one, of, uh, one of it is clearly that it is a challenge, but we can turn it to opportunity as well. If you look at the global north, the, the whole demographic changes, which somehow um, it's linked, could be linked um, to the skill shortage. Mm -hmm. um, on that, on one hand, on second hand, you look at the global south, where you see you have quite very uh, a massive level of youth unemployed, very likely either trained or that could be trained. And at the same time, they are suffering from the risk of um, brain drain. And I think one of the challenges that can turn into opportunity is how do we organize ourselves through an orderly um, migration where you can have that um, circular migration um, scheme, where you can, can I um, train um, Kenyan in IT or nurses uh, in, in Delhi, that <laughs> could go and help Ireland or Germany for five years get also experience um, from Europe and go back later on, even if it's 50% that are going back, going back to their country to also help their country before they are also acquired. That win-win um, is one clear part. The second thing that will come to, to my mind is the fact that we know very well that today our economy is going more digital. That one's very, um, very clear. I'm very concerned um, about the um, the notion of uh, near shoring, um, you know, friend shoring, um, where you know it might solve what, some problem, but just to create other problems. You know, uh, um, something for me that although we believe in Iro that there are a lot of things to fix in the supply chain business, uh, particularly in terms of child labor and forced labor. Uh, but globally, the, the supply chain has been engine of job creation, poverty alleviation. Uh, if you look at most of the emerging economy today, that has helped a lot of emerging, uh, uh, emerging economy today. So uh, that is the, uh, the second dimension that I think we really need to put uh, to work together, not to the, 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 the current uh, political environment. Actually, uh, I'm not referring I'm not only on the war in Ukraine, even before that, we can all see the political environment is uh, repatriating the production um, from the global so south. I, I, I do have a uh, uh, concern on that in terms of the impact on the job market on the, uh, on the other side, although it can also do good on this side. So my, my point is that we, we, we should not go to it in a very in a blind manner. Uh, we have to also be targeted uh, in trying to see how um, we still protect the, the globalization on, 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 on that. The, uh, the, the third dimension that I, would, I, would, I can mention, you know, it's fascinating where we notice on the labor market, the fact that um, the youth are no more interested to have one job, you know, from, from 22 to 67. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, feeling that they, they can provide they, they don't have to count on the government and because the government system maybe have failed or have failed that and they think that and the protection, the social protection we talk, they prefer taking measure themselves to protect themselves. The typical example would be that uh, gig uh, engineer that would prefer not to be, a, not to have a, um, an, uh, a, an employment relationship with uh, uh, an employer, but negotiate on zero coverage. And that we know for fact is a um, is a time bomb um, challenge on that. So that that would be more and more one we feel that we have there. The fourth one I, I will, I'm talking about. You see, the voice and the, the ability to negotiate the our what you know I know jargon. I'll talk about Convention 87 and um, Freedom of Association and Convention 98 um, um, collective um, bargaining. That 
and that in the context of uh, a genuine, very work, um, effective social dialogue system. Uh, sometimes we, 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 we tend to forget the, the, the key value of, um, of, of that in, in our labor market and the society in general. In, in, a, in a world economy today where the um, unionization rates um, are going uh, relatively and down. Um, you know, ironically, if you look at uh, in, in France, because of the challenge they are going through through their uh, pension system reform, and that has helped increasing the unionization rates on that. You know, it should be the other way around on that. So that dilemma is, is a difficult challenge also that, uh, that uh, we have. Last point, since you asked me five, um, the last one that uh, I will mention is the uh, discrimination, um, the vulnerable groups. Uh, um, on, and, and then, and for I do, you know, our, uh, uh, our constitution, the, the preamble of the constitution is no lasting peace without social justice. And that um, the group that are um, at risk of being discriminated against, uh, particularly uh, on, uh, in the context of uh, labor markets and, 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 and uh, workplace, it's crucial um, and that we look at that discrimination, uh, um, exclusion, and, and the, uh, different groups and people with some degree of disabilities, how to make room for them to be able also to access uh, to, um, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to a job on that. And all of that in a context where we really need to remind ourselves that um, uh, labor is not a commodity. Well, Director General Silvera, thank you very, very much. That was an absolute tour de force. Uh, uh, we have learned a, a huge amount and we found it all uh, fascinating, really, f the, the answers to the questions and, and your initial presentation. Thank you so much for giving us uh, some time today and we're very much in your debt. Wish you every success with the conference coming up. And I know our ambassador, Noel White in Geneva, will be looking forward to working with you. Uh, so the best the best of luck with your future endeavors and thank you once again for making yourself available. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us and uh, let me use the opportunity to thank uh, Ireland and I sincerely mean it uh, with your, your all strategy, uh, ODA strategy and the work with uh, ILO and in a very selfish way, the, uh, let me say also the work that um, Ireland and uh, Irish aid with IFAD where I was uh, uh, before. And you are always there to stand uh, with the, the, the smaller countries, the, the, the countries at the, at the bottom, I always have a very big respect uh, for Ireland for that. So thank you so much.